In the 1980s and 1990s, desktop computers began to slowly become more common and affordable in U.S. households. As computers took off, naturally many people were eager to find ways to make those useful tools help in areas outside of just data spreadsheets and office reports. One such area was education. Classrooms started having a shared computer for young students to use, software companies such as The Learning Company were formed to create educational games for early PCs to promote learning through fun. Some games, such as The Oregon Trail, were extremely popular and beloved, with new versions even being made as recently as 2024. But while learning software for the computer was nice and all, what about people who didn't have computers at school? What about those who didn't have one at home? That's where we get into the concept of educational toys. While educational toys had existed for decades with things like puzzles or toys that stimulated creativity, like building blocks or Play-Doh, the 90s led to the creation of electronic learning toys for children. One concern for children is always that they're able to read and have reading comprehension. So in 1994, the company LeapFrog Enterprises was founded by Michael Wood and Robert Lally. They quickly began to work on electronic toys and tools to promote literacy and reading comprehension. Their first product was the Phonics Desk, a toy where you simply pushed a letter to hear the name of the letter and the sound it made. There were many varieties of this kind of toy already, including notably the Speak and Spell toy that had existed since the 1970s featured in Pixar's Toy Story, but nevertheless it gave LeapFrog enough business to get more funding it needed for more advanced products. In 1998, LeapFrog acquired Explore Technologies Inc., a company famous for making the Odyssey Globe, which was a globe with a stylus that could be used to tap onto any country and tell you what it is. Words cannot describe how much I wanted this as a little kid, but alas, I was never able to get one. The staff of the two now-merged companies worked together and developed a new product in 1999 called the LeapPad. The device looks like a plastic book cover that had a speaker on it and a wired stylus. You would then buy different booklets that came with a cartridge. You'd stick the cartridge into the Leap Pad, like a Game Boy for example, and you would put the book in the grooves of the opened Leap Pad. Then after turning it on, you'd use the stylus to interact with the book. Now, the booklet did not have any screen or buttons, so how did it work? Well, the cartridge preloads what would happen when you tap certain spots of the Leap Pad. Each page spread in the Leap Pad book would have a go and stop symbol at different lengths of the page, telling you where to tap. Since they were on a different place each page, tapping that specific spot would tell the cartridge what page you're on, and then it would have everything on those pages pre-mapped out. Since it knows what page you're on, it knows what it means when you tap a word or a picture. Then you'd tap the stop button before turning the page and tapping the next go button. The books would then turn into something similar to a point-and-click computer game. Not only could you tap the words and have them read out to you, but sometimes you could tap a picture and either get extra information or a funny line of dialogue. So you've got reading, reading comprehension, and interactive stimulation all in one product. It's simple, but it works, and if someone is very young, I can totally see how this could almost imitate the idea of reading and learning being not only fun, but almost magical. Needless to say, these products became very successful, selling 500,000 Leap Pads in just its first year and winning an award for Educational Toy of the Year in 2000. By 2002, they were the third largest toy company based on revenue sales, and there were both elementary school classrooms and households that were using them to help their kids learn. In many ways, these seemed like the learning books of the future, but they got more ambitious. In 2002, LeapFrog decided to expand outside of preschoolers and kindergartners learning how to read and try to make a variation for older elementary school kids. They made the new Quantum Pad, and instead of just storybooks for little kids, they promoted the idea of mini textbooks. Now obviously the kinds of textbooks for elementary school are not going to be the giant ones you'd get in high school or a university, but there were still textbooks for math, science, and history classes many elementary students got, so this seemed like a next logical step. I myself had a quantum pad and a few history booklets for them as a kid, and they were definitely cool at the time. After all, these weren't baby book holders, no no no. These ones were for big kids. It even has muted colors, which you know means it's more mature. Obviously now that I'm in my late 20s, I haven't even seen one of these things in nearly two decades, but with how beloved and praised they were at the time, I thought it'd be fun to see how well they've held up. Obviously, I don't expect a learning tool for 8-year-olds from 20 years ago to be something mind-blowing, but with how much I and other people my age fondly remember this product, I'm curious to see if there would be anything surprisingly advanced or surprisingly awful in some of the stuff you would learn. 
After all, plenty of old textbooks become outdated for many reasons. So after finding a used quantum pad in good condition, I ordered an unopened textbook and cartridge for third grade history. This is one of the ones I used to have as a kid, so we'll see if I have any ratatouille moments when looking at it again. Now, in third grade history, what I remember learning was the same stuff taught every year. American Revolution, Constitution, Slavery, Civil War, and then, ah oh, shucks, the school year is over. I guess we'll learn about the World Wars next year, except that never ended up happening for any of my history classes until seventh grade, and even then, it still wouldn't be very detailed until high school. However, this booklet, while having colonial America and Native Americans in it, also has a section on ancient Greece and Rome. That's at least a little bit of variety. The cover claims it follows federal and state learning standards of the time, which they base off of this chart on the back where all of these standards are checked in at least one section of the book. Obviously, the educational standards of the Bush administration were its own can of worms we don't have time to get into, but this did mean if you didn't have these at home, maybe your school might have one in the classroom. Now, instead of me awkwardly holding my phone and taking a video of myself poking the book to show you every sound effect and feature inside, I'll go over some of the interesting highlights and include some of the audio I recorded from it by plugging it into my computer with an aux cord. The story part of the third grade history book is about two friends named Cleo and Alex who ditch a school field trip to a history museum by finding a secret tunnel that takes them through actual time in history. They get to learn things and take pictures without being declared as witches and burnt at the stake. On each page, you can find Cleo and Alex making various comments when you tap on them, or sometimes when you tap other objects on the page. Then at the end, they sneak their way back, and of course, no one else from the class believes them. The end. It's simple, but I guess the focus is on the learning, so whatever. So, like many point-and-click computer games, you can use the stylus to interact with what's on the page, tap a bolded word to hear the narrator say the word and define it. Potlatches were huge parties where hosts gave everything away. Tap a picture of a famous person and get a brief two to four sentences about them. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States. He wore a black top hat. I ended slavery in 1863. But you can also tap random objects, people, and background items to get random tidbits and sound effects. Olympic Postal Service coming through! This is simultaneously the most fun feature of the book and at other times the most outdated or at times even cringy. I have to admit, some of these sound effects have been living rent-free in my head for two decades, and hearing them again really unlocked some memories. Then sometimes there are bits that are actually kind of unintentionally funny. Wampanoag, this tribe met the pilgrims. Hello. Hi. There are several times where they reinforce some learning by having you connect related things. I hope we encounter new animals. Whose voyage should he join? Touch an explorer card to get. Probably the thing that stood out the most though, for better or for worse, was the section where they had some Roman leaders rap. Nero is my name, and I'm not all there. I started a great fire, and I didn't even care! Considering how many of these sounds and jingles I still remember 20 years later, that does kind of add to the testament on how effective these tools were at basic learning, or at least basic memorization. That being said, you probably noticed that it listed Julius Caesar incorrectly as a Roman emperor. We should probably move on to the actual history part. I think one of the most difficult things to consider when looking at something like this is how correct does this need to be. History is complicated and no one should expect an elementary school student or a preschooler to have the same learning abilities or knowledge as a college student. So some things will be left out and some things will be simplified. I remember that while something divided by zero is undefined, back in elementary school they simply taught me that anything divided by zero was zero, because the focus was to get us to remember our times table and division tables. Getting us confused over how to break mathematics would be an unnecessary distraction. Perhaps they thought it was simpler to say Julius Caesar was a Roman emperor rather than explain the nuances of the Roman dictatorial system and the fall of the Republic and Caesar's unique dictator for life position. Isn't it better that a little kid at least learns the basics and develops a taste for learning more? I think that's a perfectly valid argument. On the other hand, there were definitely other inaccuracies here and there that bothered me. 
This map puts several tribes in the wrong place and also weirdly lists both the Dakota and Sioux as separate tribes. While it is true that sometimes the Romans had tigers brought to the Colosseum, this incorrectly stated they were from Africa instead of Asia. The tiger imported from Africa. The book perpetuates the annoying myth that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. But honestly, that's a really common misconception that's been around forever. For some reason, on the page about ancient Rome, it has a button that tells you about the Vikings, even though they come way later. Same time, different place. Vikings formed their first settlement in Greenland. But outside of those mistakes, I think overall for elementary school kids, this is fine. He doesn't shy away from mentioning slavery or the fact that we took land from Native Americans. He talks about people, places, and culture. So what happened to these textbooks of the future? So interactive books and styluses were cool and all, but things obviously changed for LeapFrog once the iPad came out and other tablet devices. LeapFrog tried to update to their own tablet system by releasing the LeapPad Explorer in 2011, where you download various learning apps like an iPad. They've since released other similar tablets, but of course they weren't quite as popular as the original LeapPads were. In 2016, they were bought by the Hong Kong-based VTech Holdings Limited company, and they still make various educational toys for children today. I was originally going to make this video months ago, but then scrapped it halfway through. But I learned that in April of 2025, the co-founder of LeapFrog, Michael Wood, passed away while dealing with Alzheimer's, which is very tragic. It made me want to finish this video not just out of fond nostalgia for the Quantum Pad, but to also shout out how impactful educational fun can be for kids growing up. So many kids used LeapFrog products to help with their reading and other forms of early learning, and they without a doubt made a huge difference. So thanks for everything you've done, Mike. You've really made a difference. If anyone watching owned any of these products growing up, leave a comment. Some of these items are practically lost media, but I'm sure plenty of you remember them well. I'm Emperor Tiger Star, and I'll see you guys next time.